We're going to start in verses 15 in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 15, and then uh, I'll read a few past few verses there, and then go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, hopefully, I don't know how much I'll get through in a short space of time, and uh, but we'll see. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 15 says, "Know you not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? God forbid! What?" Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, should be one flesh. And But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. Let's go to chapter 7, verse 10. Chapter 7, verse 10 says, Unto the married... I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. And this is talking about uh, believer, unbeliever, uh, wherever God found them within their marriage. Uh, some of them were trying to live a life of celibacy. And Paul said that's not for everybody. Some were, and uh, yeah, we get saved within their marriage. Can you imagine somebody who is a Jew, you got two Jewish people, one of them gets saved, and then all of a sudden there's problems within the marriage. And uh, here uh, Paul tells them, he says, if you're able, let them, let them stay together. Verse 11, but if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. Let not the white husband put away his wife. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord, if any brother hath a wife that believeth not, she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put, away, put her away. And a woman which had the husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they're holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let them depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God hath called us to peace, for what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? And verse 17 is the last. But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. And so ordain I in all churches. And so with that, we'll pray. Get started in our Sunday school lesson this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray you would just be with us this morning. May you lead us and guide us. May we have sensitivity, Lord, and strength. Lord, just trusting in your word, knowing that what you say is true, and it's able to guide our lives. And Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And God has a plan for the family. We all know that. He's given us this plan back in Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, we realize that divorce was not part of the plan, but yet we understand that uh, that's just part of the world that we live in right now because of sin. You know, sin has upset everything in this world, uh, but that doesn't frustrate the grace of God. He's able to do amazing things. And uh, so in a few minutes here, we're going to talk about this uh, divorce remarriage issue here. But if we have strong people and a strong nation, we'll have strong families. I wasn't alive back then, but in 1969, uh, the report is that a governor by the name of Ronald Reagan, that everybody talks about being a great president, in 1969, and uh, as a governor of California, a man who had been divorced his own self, been put through some hard times in his life. I can't imagine. I, I guess it was back in the late 40s. His wife had divorced him, tried to say that uh, he, she had, he had put her through all kinds of mental cruelties. And back at that time, he had to prove that there was a reasonable, re uh, reasonable issue in order to get a divorce. So it was, uh, you, you had to prove your case, in other words. It wasn't just for anything and everything. So in 1969, Governor Ronald Reagan signed into bills. One, he said, is the worst decision that he made in all of his life, which is the no-fault divorce. And we're not going to bring all these issues and overwhelm the courts with all of this. And uh, just whatever. If you want a divorce, go ahead and get a divorce. And we're not going to drag this, this thing out. And uh, so it became a big issue. And we see the statistics and how that is went from not only California, but overwhelmed the whole country. And then uh, we see from that just all kinds of problems compounding, not getting better, but getting worse. The statistics here, it says from 1960 to 1980, the divorce rate went from, uh, more than doubled, from 9.2 divorces per thousand 
to 22.6 divorces per thousand. That's a big increase. Uh, this meant that while less than 20% of the couples who married in 1950 ended up in divorce, that's 20%, about 50% of couples who married in 1970 winded up in divorce. So one out of every two marriages. Approximately half the children born to married couples in the 1970s saw their parents part, and uh, we, we won't go on with the, with, with the statistics because there's no use in dragging that out. Needless to say, you know, a lot of people have been touched by this issue. Every, I, I believe every single family has been touched by this issue in one way or another. So what does God have to say? That's the important thing. What does God have to say uh, in the midst of all these heartbreaking situations um, that, that we find here? There's something uh, that we need to understand, the sensitivity of the matter, and we'll deal with that in a sensitive way, but still give the truth as God declares it. And uh, so this morning, uh, we understand that there's some who've been hurt uh, by condescending comments. That's true. You know, people judge you. And it uh, should never be the case, but uh, we, again, we live in a sinful world. And that's the way that it is. It doesn't make it right. We've got to have spiritual sensitivity and biblical honesty. But uh, not here to give you my feelings. Right? Not here to give you my feelings, but just what God says about the matter. I'm glad this morning that we serve a God who's unchangeable in all of His ways. The same God who ordained marriage in the beginning is the same one who uh, blessed us with eternal salvation. And despite the fact that we live in a sin in the world, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, I've been unfaithful, not proud about it to my Lord. But yet, though I sin, God continues to forgive me and keep me by His strong power. When we get over to the book of Ephesians, we see that uh, that same institution that God ordained back in Genesis chapter 2, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, when he's talking about the husband and the wife, he says, I show you a great mystery of Christ and His church. Of Christ and His church. Probably dumbfounded a lot of individuals. They said, what do you mean? Because for them, marriage wasn't as strong as... They said, Christ will never leave us. What are you, what are you talking about? Marriage being like Christ and the church. The husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. And everything that is drawn out there in that wonderful picture there of marriage. What, what are you talking about, Paul? And as the apostle of Christ, he speaks with authority on a wide range of issues. Marriage was not any different. And he would never contradict any scripture whatsoever. Because Scripture never contradicts Scripture. It's always the same. If you find it in one place, it'll be the same in the other places. And so when we look at the Scripture, Paul will never contradict Christ. Of course, we've got to keep things in its context. And uh, we've got to understand it in its biblical setting and so on and so forth. Paul would never contradict the Scriptures. He would never soothe people's conscience. He would tell it how it is, but in a tender fashion. So when we come to 1 Corinthians 7, the issue was no different. They were dealing with a lot of the same things that we deal with today. Paul said that singleness is not better than marriage. Marriage is not any better than singleness. Uh, being single doesn't make you more spiritual. Being married doesn't make you any more spiritual. We saw that last week. And the important thing is whatever state that you're in to, to live there for God's glory, whether it be singleness or marriage. And so Paul addresses the unmarried and the widows. We see that verses uh, 9 and 10 begins to talk about them. Some people say the unmarried there in verse 9 refers to male widows. I, I don't buy into that philosophy because he uses that same word in verse 11. Where it says, that, but if, uh, if she depart, let her remain unmarried. And departing there, is, we'd understand that to be the divorce. Because her unbelieving husband has put her away, given her this bill of divorcement. And Paul says here, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled. So I don't believe it to be talking about the widows in verse uh, 8, 9, 10 there. But uh, I believe it to be talking about the unmarried. And uh, so he says, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. So the Christian was encouraged to never divorce. Never divorce. 
He, she or she or whatever the case may have been, he or she was never to be the initiator of any divorce whatsoever. They were to stay in that marriage by the grace of God with, with anything that God could give them to remain there, uh, albeit without abuse. God never condones abuse or to be put in a dangerous situation. Paul says that if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. You're not under bondage. It's not up to you to keep that marriage together. If they depart, you can do nothing about that. Despite how hard that you've tried, you are not under bondage. He says, don't, don't rack your brains and try to say, oh, if I only did this, or I only did that, or if, it, if, if this would have been different, or that would have been different, if, if this would have happened, then, then maybe I could have kept it together. He says, you're not under bondage. So don't destroy yourself over it. But if there be any way to remain in that marriage as long as you can, um, stay there as long as you can. And we'll get to remarriage a little bit later. But I want to bring in the, the, the other passages of Scripture, if I may, uh, to kind of paint a broad picture here, give us some principles, so guide our understanding and imply what God says specifically. And uh, we'll get uh, to as much as we can get to this morning. But marriage was intended for how long? Forever and ever, for life. There to be one flesh. It was not to be broken up for any reason whatsoever. In fact, you know, Jesus kind of gives us some instructions on this. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 19. Here we come to Matthew 19. Probably want to stay there for a little bit of time. So that's 27, 28, let's see. All right, this is one of the most uh, disputed passages of scriptures here, but here specifically we find in verses 1 through 12. I'll go ahead and just read it real quick. It says, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, He departed from Galilee, came into the coast of Judea, beyond Jordan. Great multitudes followed Him. He healed Him there. The Pharisees also came unto Him, tempting Him, and saying unto Him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And He answered and said unto them, Have you not read that He which made them at the beginning made them male and female. They start with Deuteronomy 24. Jesus starts with Genesis 2. And he says in verse 5, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What God therefore hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Now they ask in verse 7, Why did Moses command a bill of divorcement? Verse 8, Jesus said, Moses didn't command it, he suffered it. Uh, to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. Verse 9, I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committed adultery, whoso marry her which is uh, put away doth commit adultery. So, we understand what marriage is, and then the context, and so on. This is how we'll look at it. God has a wonderful plan for marriage. The Lord, as He comes into this region here, He says He's leaving His ministry there in Galilee. He departs. He goes into the region of Judea beyond Jordan, a little area they would call Perea. It's interesting in the context of everything that's going on. It's right there where Jesus is that He asked Him about this issue of, of divorce and, and that kind of thing. Now, what happens in Perea, uh, a lot of the people that were living during that point in time would have realized why the Pharisees would have tempted them right there at that point, at this place, at this time. Why? Because in Matthew chapter 11, we understand that John the Baptist is a, a fervent preacher and he uh, understood something that took place in history, which is there's a guy by the name of Herod Antipas. He has a brother by the name of Philip. Philip and Herod Antipas say they were going to Rome. I forget what the occasion is all about, but uh, there they 
Herod Antipas has an affair with Herodias. Herodias divorces Philip. Uh, Herod Antipas divorces his wife. The two get together. And now all of a sudden, Herod Antipas and Herodias, they are married to each other in a way that uh, John the Baptist and both Jesus said was not lawful or right. So upon their marriage, here, uh, John the Baptist condemns the saying. He says, it's not lawful for you to have Herodias, your brother's wife. He was a half-brother, but that didn't make it any better. And uh, so anyway, that was the backdrop. Matthew chapter 11, Jesus calls Herod Antipas that fox. And then for that reason of, of everything that's transpiring and spiraling, Matthew 11, I think, is when uh, John the Baptist was in prison, sent the disciples, say, are you the Christ? Do we look for another then we realize in Matthew chapter 14, from Matthew chapter 11, where Jesus confirms that He is the Christ. Go and tell John what you've seen and heard. Matthew 14, we receive the fact that John the Baptist is now dead after Herod the Antipas has his party. Uh, all of a sudden they ask for the head of John the Baptist on a platter and he loses his head. But Herod the Antipas hears of the fame of Jesus and he assumes that Jesus is John the Baptist risen from the dead. All that in Matthew 14 and uh, verse 4. Uh, well, Matthew 14, 4 is where John the Baptist said that it's not lawful for him to have his wife. All this is in the backdrop. So if John the Baptist says that it's not lawful for thee to have, the, have him to have uh, Herodias to be his wife, at this same place where Herod had John the Baptist locked up and had him lose his head over the matter, this same place is where they ask Jesus. Why? Because they're trying to get rid of Jesus. It's this place where they ask Him the question, Is it lawful for thee? You know, what does the Bible say? Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every, every cause? So do you see why they would ask Him? They're trying to tempt Him maliciously seeking to examine him, that perhaps he might fall to the same fate as John the Baptist. Now, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? There are two schools going on during this time, the Rabbi Halal and the other Rabbi Shammai. Rabbi Halal would say, it's, you can divorce your wife for anything. If you don't find favor in your wife, if she don't look pretty to you, if she's burnt your food, if, if you just get up one day and she just causes you to be angry, you write her that bill of divorcement and it'll be fine. For every cause, this is the question that the Pharisees ask them here. The other rabbi would say that you had to have a, a particular relevant cause. It couldn't be just for anything, but it had to be something justifiable in order for you to put away your, your wife. So those were the two prevailing schools. So needless to say, the Pharisees would have expected Jesus to answer under one of the two schools of thought. Are, are, are you, do you follow the line of Rabbi Halal? Or do you follow the line of Rabbi Shammai? But Jesus gives them a completely different answer than what they're expecting. Because they're, they're uh, leaning on Deuteronomy 24 to try to trap him, to try to get him to fall to the same prey as John the Baptist. Because that's how they are expecting him to answer. But the Lord will answer this ongoing debate, but as He answers it, He'll plainly discourage divorce. And they wouldn't have expected the answer that they got. Divorce destroys a wonderful plan. Jesus answers, Have you not read that He which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And He said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and a twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore there are no more... Two, but they are one flesh. Wherefore, God, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. So he gives, uh, I throw this in here just because I, I continually want to press upon this issue because of the craziness that's going on in our world. But the one man, one woman, the masculinity and femininity and kind of thing. One man and one woman. That's the way God planned it. That's the way God ordained it. This was what He expected. God, when He created the first marriage, He didn't say that uh, He created uh, Adam and then Steve. You've heard that before. He, can make, he 
What he did was he put Adam to sleep, got, took out his rib, and he made a help meet for him. Not a carbon copy, somebody that would complement him. And uh, it's just really amazing that, that uh, the way that God designed it to complement one of another. Uh, we see masculinity and femininity, that goes beyond anatomy, right? You know, you can do all the butchering that you want to do, but that doesn't make you any different than the way that God designed you. The way that God designed you is the perfect order. You can try to change the anatomy, but that doesn't change what you are. The XY chromosomes, we can go into that, different design, different uh, order and such, but just down to the very basics, Brother Ken, is a, is a woman, does she think different than you, or does she have different emotions than you do? Uh, yeah, God made it that way. There's a lot of psychological, emotional, spiritual differences. And so there's a big difference here, but needless to say, it was between one man and one woman. And uh, even in the realm of nature, we understand uh, just being on a farm. Hey, two bulls don't get along together, do they? <laughs> you got to separate those things. And just keep it the way nature designed it. <laughs> That's simple for me. But then he has a wonderful, he has a divine institution. Matthew 19, 5, he gives us this institution. He repeats this four times. He says, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Now, he repeats this several times throughout the Bible. If God repeats anything, that means it's important, isn't it? First mentioned, Genesis 2, 24. We see Matthew 19, 5, Mark 10, verses 6 through 8, Ephesians 5, 31. I believe it's implied, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 15 through 20. That's why we read the scriptures that we did. But although it doesn't state it explicitly, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, that's what it's implying. But the building block of society is the family. Families are to reproduce and to make more families. That's the way it works. It's, it's obvious. And uh, to cleave. What, what does it mean to cleave? It's not like going to a butcher shop and they take a cleaver and separate. Now, cleaving means to be glued together to make one stuck, you know. Uh, you kids probably, as little kids, you put glue between your fingers and stuck them together. And then you had to go try to pry them apart, right? Uh, you glue two pieces of paper, you try to pull them apart, it always tears. But it's to be glued together and make one. And uh, that's what happens in, in marriage here. So the divine institution of marriage is entered into and it begins when a man leaves his father and mother he takes his wife cleaves unto her and it makes this marriage there's been some faulty teachings over the years I want to go to Malachi chapter 2 really quick just keep your place here Matthew We go back to Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 we understand that it wasn't sexual relations that made a man and wife it wasn't uh, wasn't government or a church church wasn't back then in Genesis 2 the government wasn't back then in uh, Genesis 2 so what made them husband and wife where, where did this all come from Malachi chapter 2 verse 14 well this is where God is correcting his, his priests there, to do, dealing treacherously with their wives. Verse 14, he says, uh, Yet you say, Wherefore? Wherefore? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, and yet she is thy companion, and the wife of thy, what's that next word? Covenant. What God has joined together. Well, how and when did this happen? Well, there was a covenant that took place there. Every marriage is a covenant marriage. It means covenant means cutting. There's a cutting from father and mother, joining unto his wife. We could say that the marriage covenant's like a salt or blood covenant it's to remain and to force until one of the partners die. And it's a vow that was witnessed, a mutual commitment to each other before an altar. You know, as you get a husband, or the soon-to-be husband and wife, stand before a great crowd of witnesses here. 
do you take so and so to be your lawfully wedded husband? Do you take so and so to be your lawfully wedded wife? And then they make their vows before God. It was witnessed uh, not only before the people, but before God and uh, established that marriage covenant. So it wasn't just, you can say, well, I, I, don't, I don't believe in that little paper that uh, I signed my name to, uh, stating that uh, the state of Rhode Island recognizes my marriage that I filed with the courthouse. That doesn't change the fact that you're married. You say, well, I don't feel married. Well, that doesn't change the fact that you're married. You say, well, you know, I didn't get married in a church, so that doesn't change the fact that you're married. <laughs> well, we were unbelievers and we didn't recognize what the Bible taught. But well, that doesn't change the fact that you're married. In light of that, there's a divine union. They two should be one flesh. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 15 through 18, he says, What? Know you not that your bodies are the members of Christ? And shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know you not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two saith he should be one flesh, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. He that committed fornication sendeth against his own body. His own body would be because he's, the two are made one flesh. And if you do something, anything... You're not sinning against anything but your own body. Because God says they are one flesh. And God's simply saying that this, this is a permanent relationship. And this permanent relationship is to be a priority in our lives. We are to love our wives even as Christ loved the church. We are to, to, to give ourselves for them. To, to, that we might have a God in our homes. And when we have kids and we're raising our kids for the glory of God, to steward God's heritage and to, to raise it. In fact, this is what Malachi 2.15 tells us. You know, he says that you might raise up a godly seed. Exactly what uh, Kim and Ed are doing right now. Raising up a seed to follow after the Lord. It's what I'm trying to do in my marriage. And our kids are to be sent out with power to make a mark in this world for the glory of God. And divorce will always destroy that plan that God has designed for us. And it's, I tell you, it's just as heartbreaking as death. God made no provision whatsoever for divorce because marriage was instituted before the entrance of sin and that was no cause, there was no reason for divorce. But it does give that exception clause which we'll get to in just a little while. Sin's always the underlying cause of, of lust. Why did God not institute it in Genesis 2? Well, because there was no sin there. There wasn't a, a lust going on. There wasn't an angry thought. There wasn't uh, rebellion or resistance. There wasn't... Um, wasn't any cause because sin had not entered into the world at this time. And uh, it's because of lust, greed, selfishness, hatred, which brings about divorce, is it not? And yet God did not go back and say, well, you know what? Now that sin entered into the world, I'm going to change my mind about this. Maybe I'll have to rethink this marriage thing and write in some new principles. He didn't change it, did he? So this would be evident as we look here, as we head into the next verse in Matthew chapter 19 from verse 5 into verse 6, where they said that there be no more one flesh, wherefore a God that joined together let not man put asunder. So in verse 7 now, where the Pharisees are probably all frustrated over the fact that Jesus didn't answer the way that He wanted them to, and so they begin to press Him. Why did Moses then command to give a writing a divorce? And to put her away. In other words, they said, well, we had no option other than to divorce her. Moses commanded it after all. No, Jesus said He didn't command it. Jesus started with God's intention for marriage, and so in frustration, He answers them once again. Divorce will always display the awful problem. An awful problem. And, uh, you know, it leads into several things. A lot of scripture twisting, exposing a hard heart. We can look at those uh, as we go into here. But 
they, they are going back to Deuteronomy 24. So now the Lord is going to answer what Deuteronomy 24 is all about. The Pharisees said in verse 7 that Moses commanded this, but Jesus said Moses suffered it, he endured it, he put up with it. And those are two very different things. Mm -hmm. That word suffer there, I looked that up one time, I was going to stay on that. Mm -hmm. That word suffer there means allowed but not really supported. Yeah. Right. Well, he, he allowed it, but he, he didn't support that. Yeah, he permitted it, yeah. Right. Yeah, Jesus said this was never a command. And uh, so if we go back to Deuteronomy 24. Let me go back to Deuteronomy 24. We see verses 1 through 4. Deuteronomy 24 says, When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement, and give it unto her hand, and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and do what? Be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, or husband, former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife after she is defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord. Now shall not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Here's what some people teach. They say, well, uh, the, the, the second marriage, because God intended to be one flesh, if you go and be married to another, well, that marriage is not legitimate. You need to go back to your original husband. Here, Moses says, that is sin. He says, you cannot go back to your former husband. Isn't that what he says in verse 4? He says, may not take her again, uh, her for, former husband which sent her away may not take her again to be his wife. That's what the Bible says, not what I say. After she is defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord. Now shall not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Two wrongs don't make a right. Um, There's a lot to, to, to really unpack, and many numerous books are written on that issue. Um, but uh, let me just point out here, here, the word for defiled in our text refers to some uncleanness. Uh, that's debated. Um, used in Numbers 5, 13 through 14. You can come to me later for these, these verses. Uh, a lot of times where it talks about being defiled, it was in reference to idolatry, wizardry, immorality, bestiality, a lot of these touching the dead, wide scope of things, that, that would be defiling the land. Uh, he says that uh, if he goes and takes her again to be his wife, it would be a defilement. And uh, she is defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord, that should not cause the land to sin, is what we, we just read. Under the Mosaic law, marriage was held so sacred to both the betrothed bride and the adulterous wife. You know, if somebody had a wife and a man caught her and, you know, say, well, let's just take the instance for, for when uh, uh, Jacob, you remember, you know, he goes into the land of Sychar and Dana, one of his, his daughters, goes into Sychar and then this man takes her and has relations with her and then all of a sudden it begins to be a big issue. Normally in that case, according to the law of Moses, what would they do? Take her out and stone both of them, wouldn't they? Put them to death. So it was a big issue. And uh, I think some of this was to do, and I don't believe that this was, was everything, but uh, whether it was premarital or extramarital or whatever have you, a lot of this just compounded the, the problems that were going on in Israel. You know, remember what was going on with uh, the, the era of Balaam. And so instead of like being a nation of continual death all about you, they would just write a bill of divorcement. It seemed more merciful uh, for, for those during this time. That's why when we get to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 2, where Joseph is, is just in a conundrum about what to do, he finds out Mary, his wife, is now pregnant. What do I do? Do I take her and present her before the elders and say she's worthy of death? Or do I 
as a just man, just go ahead and put away privily and write a bill of divorcement and be done with it. And so he, he is meditating on what to do. And the angel says, fear not to take Mary to be thy wife. See, he could have that option as well, just to go on and continue on in the marriage. He didn't have to write the bill of divorcement. And he chose that latter end, which is to continue on in the marriage. Continue on in the marriage. Um, he sought her to put her away privily by the writing of divorcement, and even if that, the Bible still calls him a just man. But I'm glad that uh, he continued on with the marriage and still took her to be his wife. Uh, but he was a just man in either case. Joseph was not a hardness of heart kind of, of individual. Does that make sense? He wasn't a hardness of heart kind of individual. He was a just man. Marriage debate brings out a lot of uh, scripture twisting, doesn't it? Yeah, let's, let's wrestle with it and try to figure out what to do. Matthew 19, the Pharisees were no different. They said it was command. But God's the maker of marriage. He says, What God has put together, let no man put asunder. But man is the inventor of divorce. Uh, Moses suffered it. And God is the protector of the innocent victims here who fall prey to what man has invented. And you can say, you know, just they probably did back in that day. I'm not sure. But they said, well, I'm, out, I'm out of here. You, you upset me. You made me mad. And so I'm out of here. I divorce you. God regulated what they could do, what they couldn't do, didn't He? He says, except to be for fornication. You cannot put her away for every reason. It can't be just for anything and everything. This man must sit, sit down and thoughtfully write out, did she fulfill this ex exception clause or not? It wasn't the case for Antipas. And this is what the Word of God says. This is even evidenced by what Jesus said to the woman at the well. He recognized all five marriages, did He not? He says, you've had five husbands. And the one you're with now is not your husband. And the Lord goes to the heart of the issue. And the heart of the problem, which is always a hard heart. It's always bad in the physical realm where your arteries are hardened, but it's also just as bad in the realm of marriage. The reason why Moses wrote this is for the hardness of heart. Jesus did not place blame on anyone, but he recognized that sin is brought on the tragedy of divorce. It's not what, man, not what God designed, but it's what man chooses. It's the worst kind of unbelief. To say that God can't help my marriage. Later on, Matthew 19, right after the marriage and divorce issue, Jesus addresses forgiveness. You see that right, uh, right below that, uh, where he says, uh, where they ask him, um, let's see. Where am I? Tells him, let's see. I should have come murmured. When he man heard sorrowful, he had great possessions. I'll have to get that I'll have to get that reference for you. But uh, he does uh, encourage forgiveness to work things out for reconciliation, and that was it was God's plan. And the Bible says, with God all things are possible. So I want to skip. No, let's do this. Sin brings on the wrath of God. Right? If I sin, what does the Bible say I deserve? Death. The chastisement of God. Uh, I believe if God said, you know, he's <laughs> gone too far. I mean, God is just in everything that He does. But it provokes the wrath of God. That's what I want to get across. It provokes the wrath of God. Yet in repentance, God, instead of, instead of just being saying, away with you, I'm done with you, I, I divorce you, I get rid of you, He doesn't do that. He forgives us, and so, so often He does. And I say that because of back in the book of Hosea. <laughs> he was quite a prophet, wasn't he? 
Go and marry this woman by the name of Gomer. Take her. She, she is in all kinds of immorality and uh, adultery. He, he could have accused her of all kinds of stuff. But God tells, tells Hosea, he says, I want you to go and take her again to be thy wife. Does he not? Go and take her back and I'll give you the capacity to forgive. Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39 are some of the greatest verses in all the Bible. And pretty much he says at the end of it, he says, Who shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord? Divorce destroys a wonderful plan. It displays a problem. It develops into permissiveness. Verse 9. I say unto whosoever should put away his wife, except to be for fornication, and marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. It was extreme. The disciples were not expecting this either. As he is addressing the Pharisees, even the disciples were taken back by this. Jesus didn't sigh with either thought. Uh, he gave one exception and one exception only. What was it again? Fornication. And this was relevant, uh, particularly to this time. Again, we go back to the context. What was the context? Herod Antipas. He took Herodias to be his wife. And essentially, when it gets down to it, Jesus says this about Herod Antipas. He says, you are living in adultery. You are living in adultery. This was when the Pharisees and the Herodians started warming up to each other. Here the Lord uh, recognizes the fact that, uh, you know, if he's, their original question is, should a man put away for every cause? You open it for every cause. Jesus said there was only one exception, except to be for fornication. You're opening up a can of worms. There's going to be all kinds of immorality going on. And just sin is going to wax worse and worse. And marriages are going to be torn apart. Families are going to be destroyed. He said, you're just making it worse. You're not making it better. He understands that there's got to be only, only one thing and one thing only. If you don't stop at fornication, where do you stop, in other words? Where do you stop? Israel had created a divorce culture much like what we see today. It's true. Can't get around it. As the way that we're living today is almost like what it was when they were dealing back there, just writing for anything and everything. And just up in uh, Pennsylvania, close where we would go, uh, lived up there, there's a little town called Lake Race Town. And of course, you think of the Johnstown floods and all this that are up there in Pennsylvania, at least I do. You have a little crack in a dam, that dam releases, it destroys a whole town. Destroys a whole community. An easy divorce leads to an immoral culture. The prohibition, what does Jesus mean when he says fornication? The word for pornography. Uh, whatever fornication is, we know number one, it's a sexual sin, right? Number two, sin, it's a sin against our own bodies according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 17, 18, 19. Why? Because it's a union made as in one flesh. So it's a sin against your own body and it's a sexual sin. Both of those are wrong, but then he gives a, a permission here. The whole conversation about Deuteronomy 24, the reference we find here in Matthew 19 had one question. What is the grounds for divorce? Was it for anything and everything? Or was it uh, for something specific? What was the grounds for divorce? That's what the question is about. It wasn't whether divorce was right or wrong. It says, what is the grounds for divorce? The exception is that if there is some unfavorable circumstance that would legitimize divorce... For this idea of fornication here, making divorce acceptable, not like in Herod's situation, but under that exception of fornication, if you give that writing a divorcement under the right context, under what, if it falls under it exactly the way that the Lord said that it should be, then that woman is free from marriage. 
But she has a bill of divorcement. The Bible says she's free. She's been set free from that marriage. That stuff is hard. It's not an easy thing to discuss, even as a pastor. But she's free. She's not under bondage. Once she has that right of divorcement in hand due to whatever cause-worthy circumstance, fitting under this context of fornication, she's free to remarry. That's what we find back in Deuteronomy 24. If there's a worthy cause of divorce, then divorce can occur. But again, it's very specific. It's not, it's not for anything and everything. If divorce occurs under that worthy cause, then it says she can remarry. But if she remarries, she can never go back to her former husband. In Deuteronomy 24, God did not allow for remarriage. But instead, uh, God did allow for remarriage, but uh, uh, Exodus 20, I put that in there. Because one of the commands given, in, one of the Ten Commands that are given in Scripture. You should, well, of course, we know you shouldn't cover it to your neighbor's wife. We understand that. But thou shalt not commit adultery, right? And then Jesus says, if you divorce her for any other reason than fornication, you're doing what? You're committing adultery? Which is strictly against what God commands? And so if He's commanded that thou shalt not commit adultery, if you go over to Deuteronomy 24 and God permits, He doesn't command it, but He permits it, He allows it because of the hardness of heart. Then would God be going against His Word when He said, do not commit adultery, but now over here He says, you're able to write a bill of divorcement. In other words, the perpetual adultery issue. So if, if, if somebody gets a divorce, she goes and remarries another. Is she committing a perpetual adultery? Well, if he's permitted that exception in Deuteronomy 24 for that writing of the bill of divorce before uncleanness for the fornication, but then all of a sudden he calls that bill of divorcement adultery, then he's going against his own word. You, you follow me? So if the woman does remarry, she can't, can't be considered an adulterous woman or be living in perpetual adultery. What God puts together, let not man put asunder. But if God allows such a remarriage, uh, then you ought never to allow remarriage to be broken. Because it's, he recognizes that marriage and it's one flesh. You say to me, Pastor, what about all those other scriptures? I've looked through every one of them. I've read 800 pages of books <laughs> And all of them just, I mean, you have a plethora of ideas. I've read, I feel like I've read the whole Bible in one week. I've struggled, I've prayed, I've, I've tried. You can come up to me with any scripture, I'll be happy to discuss them with you. You say, what about Mark chapter 10, verses 4 through 12? And it says there's, there's no exception clause in there. Well, Mark is repeating exactly the same thing that Matthew Gives us right here in Mark chapter 19 the exact same context, the exact same references. He just didn't record the exception clause. What about Luke chapter uh, 16, 16 18? And Jesus addresses them over there who are trying to justify themselves. And He says, yet you won't come unto Me, yet you can't keep the law, yet you're not faithful to your vows, and you're not faithful to your marriage. What about that? What about Matthew chapter 5, verse 32? And there I believe that he, in the context of Matthew 5, 32, he says, don't have just an outward observance to look good in the eyes of men. Have something that's real to you. But all in all, he always points them back to Genesis 2, God's original intent, the authority on marriage, as discussed. Jesus still recognized that fornication was still grounds for divorce, should it ever come to that. But folks, realize that God still hates divorce. Isn't that still in your Bible? God hates divorce. Malachi chapter 2, verse 16. God hates divorce. Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. 
He didn't change his thoughts. He didn't change his opinions on it. So I want to transition back to our text in 1 Corinthians 7. Boy, I ran out of time, didn't I? In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul is addressing a whole new different can of worms. It's very different than what Jesus was addressing or uh, Moses addressed during his time. 1 Corinthians 7 was addressing something entirely different. And uh, because of this new dispensation of grace, it would have been similar in my mindset to what happened with Ezra and Nehemiah when they were coming back into Jerusalem. And they were just marrying with all these. uh, They were unequally yoked and a lot of unequal marriages. Um, Jewish believers with all kinds of unbelievers bringing in, of course, it would have led into the same kind of problems that Solomon had with his 700 wives. But their way of dealing with it uh, was Ezra and Nehemiah told me, he says, you need to put away them wives. Put them away. Put them away. As far as I know, they didn't remarry. It doesn't say that at all, but they didn't remarry. Paul, on the other hand, he's addressing believers who would be single to dedicate themselves to serving God, but he's also addressing what to do if an unbeliever, par- um, unbelieving partner departs and gives this bill of divorcement. What do you do? I know in certain terms, and we'll have to go back and do this some other time because of the time here, he tells them, remain as you are. If they, divorce, if they let you depart, go ahead and depart, but just... Keep praying for that marriage. Keep praying for that marriage. Keep working on it. Remain single or be reconciled. It's one of the reasons why I like the movie Fireproof. How many of you have seen that movie? I, I've never seen anything happen like that, what you see in that movie, which is they continually despite the hardships that are there, working on it and working on it and working on it, eventually when they were almost ready to divorce, they finally come back together. We can see that in Hosea 2, or the book of Hosea as well, I should say. But we need people who will fight for their marriages. We need people who will fight for their marriages. We need people to do all that they can to hold that marriage together. And uh, you can. You can. So what am I saying to you this morning? I'm saying that it's not for anything and everything. I'm saying just as the words of Jesus, He says, except it be for fornication. That's a touchy subject. Any comments, questions, and then we'll close in a word of prayer. Yes, sir. One thing I think is about then, that 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 he wants us to do this. Yeah, amen. And do what he says and trust him with the outcome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the outcome. And this church, and it's not the other churches that have um, thrown Christian marriages, the guys are saying, they married to learn to turn back to their God. Yeah. And then the strength, send it to this. Now, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to try to tell everybody, oh, not now. I'll let them talk to you. No. Because mm-hmm. they're too in the dance. They're doing the stress. Yeah. And the, if, if, if they try to do the business, or the deal of the business, and then the result to die. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, people get divorced for all the wrong reasons today. They say, well, if somebody gets cancer, all of a sudden, you know, I'm done. I'm looking for another marriage. The Bible condemns that. I said, well, I just, uh, I like this other woman better, so I'm just going to leave you and go marry. The Bible condemns that. I said, that's wrong. That's wrong. And to be honest with you, I like the fact that uh, that's the way it is because I I want marriages to stay together. So, all right, let's uh, close with prayer. And uh, Brother Ed, would you mind closing us out in a word of prayer? our minds and show all the uh, fallacies and uh, you know, 
Paul's statements about Scripture, that Scripture is clear. And we must dive into it, continue with that relationship, and follow this is one that in our culture today wants to show, well, don't get married, don't get married. Marriage is a commitment. Father, it is just like love. It takes work. It's the commitment. It's an action word. Oh, we have to continue to strive and work within it. Um, I know there's times I'm so difficult to be with. And Father, it takes, it takes work. Uh, but anything of value like that will take work. And so, Lord, just continue to help us that we struggle with that. Uh, help those that are maybe struggling uh, within a marriage. I pray that you will help those that are uh, thinking about marriage to understand the severity of it, the commitment by the Father. But again, all decisions must come before you. Uh, I think we have that, Father. I think we are not left to founder. We do have your word. We do have the encouragement. We can go to other believers that can shore us up within your word. And again, Lord, uh, it may seem complicated to us, but. We have the Holy Spirit there to guide us through each and every one. So again, Father, I thank you for this time. And that you continue to watch over this church. Help us with our decisions. And Father, we also pray for those that are coming into the service. And uh, the message that we follow. And just pray for uh, the gospel to go forth. Again, I thank you for this time. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll try to continue on. 1 Corinthians 7. I just believe that it was important to to understand God's intent before we jump into... So I, what I'm saying is I'll continue that. Uh, in fact, I'll be... Never mind, I'll be preaching on 1 Corinthians 7 this morning. So, All right. Thank you for listening.